Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Jeffrey with Achieve Ed. Today, we're gonna be taking a look at this article that I read in the Wall Street Journal. This was published last Saturday. And I read this and I found this actually really interesting and I wanted to uh, basically share this article with you guys, go over kind of what it talks about and then give my analysis at the end on what this article means to you as a college applicant. So the article is titled, The Secrets of Elite College Admissions. In the final shaping of an incoming class, academic standards give way to other more ambiguous factors. So, I mean, this essay is kind of long. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but pretty much it starts off by saying how the admissions process at a lot of top schools is very secretive. However, the author of this article, Jeffrey Salingo, was actually able to be in that admissions office with the admissions officers at a few colleges. So he talks about how every year, especially at these top colleges, he uses Emory University as an example, uh, the amount of applications far exceeds the amount of available space in that class. So for Emory, uh, he says the school received a record 30,000 applications for fewer than 1,400 spots in its incoming class. So that's a lot of people that aren't going to be making it into Emory. Now, a lot of college applicants and their parents like to think that, you know, the college process is mostly an objective process, all based on SAT scores and based on grades and stuff like that. But according to the author of this article, by interviewing dozens of admissions officers at other schools, everything is much more ambiguous. The lack of simple standards was most pronounced when I watched admissions officers complete their shaping of the class, the last sorting of applicants before final decisions are sent out in the spring. Shaping is the step at the very end of the process that most teenagers and their parents are unaware of. It's where selective admissions is the most unfair. The point at which a decision based on traditional criteria such as grades and test scores gives way to one based partly on other factors such as money, race, gender, and major. Next, he talks about what he observed inside the admissions office of Emory University. So according to him, uh, you know, after their initial kind of screening of all the applicants, uh, they realized that they had too many applicants, they needed to cut down on some of them uh, in order to shape their final class, right? So they said they had to shift a thousand applications from the thin admit stack to the much larger deny or waitlist piles. And this article basically details what that process looked like. So for example, one student, um, they moved him to deny after looking at his senior year grades, lots of Bs, noting that they had already rejected four other academically stronger students from his high school. They even switched a legacy applicant to deny after noting that uh, he had kind of light extracurricular involvement. And then it actually goes into detail about this one case uh, where this applicant was the child of an Emory employee. And typically, um, if if you have that kind of relationship, um, you know, you get perks in the admissions process. But this particular person, uh, they were kind of, you know, on the edge about this applicant. So one admissions officer in the room, there were three in total, one said, move him to deny, let's reject him. A second one said, let's waitlist him instead. The third one, hedged. And there, this article basically says like, they literally discussed this application for 12 minutes. Believe it or not, the longest amount of time, according to this article, it says their longest deliberation about any applicant that morning. So 12 minutes is actually a really long time. Uh, usually it suggests that, you know, they're spending much less time on an applicant, but basically, okay. So one said deny, one said waitlist, one hedged, okay? So then, they eventually voted and, you know, after a lot more voting, a lot more deliberation, they finally admitted this student. Now, this article has an interesting sentence. It says, the high school senior, uh, referring to the person, the child of the Emory employee who was just admitted, the high school senior never knew how close he had come to a rejection and how much the college's priorities, in this case, for children of employees rather than for any particular aspect of his academic or personal life, played a role in getting him over the finish line. Never knew. He just got that admit letter. He doesn't know how close this was. I mean, you can read the article if you want. This was like a very long deliberation. They finally like put him in the admit pile. 
but this applicant had no idea. So this article goes into more detail uh, about other schools. I wanted to read another quote right here. Uh, they actually highlighted this quote in the article. So they were, so the admissions officers were kind of deliberating over this uh, female applicant who wanted to major in pre-law. She ran track in middle school and made the varsity soccer team as a sophomore. One admissions officer found the recommendations lacking because they focused on her personal qualities instead of what happened in the classroom. I like her if we have room, someone said. Well, we don't, said another. And, you know, basically this is saying that there's a lot of people, you know, that they'd love to admit if they had space, but they don't have room. And that's why they have to do this kind of last minute, kind of, uh, you know, last round of, uh, you know, moving people from the mid to deny uh, because they just don't have the space in the class. Now, so anyways, they go through, you know, a few more colleges, they talk about Davidson College in North Carolina. Uh, they talk about Lafayette College in Pennsylvania, uh, more specifically about how financial aid actually played a process at that school. Because, uh, you know, at a lot of top schools like the Ivy League schools and including Emory University, um, they're need blind, but um, Lafayette College was a need based uh, college. Like they take into account how much you can pay when they decide whether to admit you or not. Um, so you can read the article if you want. I definitely recommend it. Um, but I wanted to focus in on this very last paragraph in the article. I thought it was really powerful. In the end, it's unclear if an incoming class would be much different if admissions officers worried less about shaping it. The simple fact is that the freshman class at any top ranked college is eerily similar to those at other highly selective schools. Most applicants will never know how close they came to either the admit or the deny pile. At some point, many qualified students were probably in both. And that's the end of the article. Uh, once again, I recommend you read this entire thing. I kind of just uh, got the parts that I wanted to highlight, um, but there's a lot of good stuff in here. So basically my point or my kind of takeaway from this article is that first, right, this is not a purely objective process. I mean, I'm sure, uh, sure a lot of you already know that. Like, it's not just all about grades, not all about test scores. But this article really highlights just how much of it is just based on subjectivity, right? Just based on what the admissions officer thinks will, you know, who is going to be a good fit in the class. That's what shaping is all about, just creating that class, right? So if they think, you know, you're qualified, but, you know, we're not really looking for this type of applicant, then you know, you're gonna get put in the deny pile. And uh, that's just, you know, unfortunately what happens at a lot of these top schools. Now, my second takeaway is that this really shows, I guess, how like random, uh, I don't really know a better word to use, but I guess random uh, that the admissions process is. Like it could be a very qualified applicant, but still get denied. And I talked about earlier about the legacy applicant who usually have, you know, huge advantages yet they're denied. So there's really no like set kind of guideline. Like it's not like, oh, you know, if you are legacy, your chances increase by 30%. Like, of course you can use empirical statistics to kind of make that kind of connection, but it's nothing like, like very concrete, right? And really not much about the emissions uh, process is concrete. It's, it's all subjective. Uh, so I guess, um, I guess, like if you're watching this video and you want to, you know, like what did you learn from this? I would say that um, like when you're applying to a school, just recognize there's that kind of random factor to it. So uh, if you get rejected from a school that you really thought you could get into, like there could be many reasons you didn't get into that school. Don't, uh, don't use that as a bellwether uh, for all the other schools you apply to. So take for instance, right? You applied to um, Vanderbilt University and you didn't get in. Uh, but And then you also applied to all the Ivy League schools which are technically ranked higher than Vanderbilt, right? According to US News. Um, now you get rejected from Vanderbilt and then your Ivy League uh, decisions come out like next week or something like that. Don't look too much into that Vanderbilt decision. You got rejected. But that doesn't mean like, oh, you know, since I got rejected from there to build, that means I must have gotten rejected from all these other, you know, even, I guess, even more 
um, selective schools. No, that, that's just not the case, right? You can get rejected from Vanderbilt and accepted into Harvard, right? You can get rejected from Emory, accepted into Yale, okay? You can get rejected from Dartmouth, get accepted into Princeton, right? This happens all the time. There's many applicants like this. So I guess my point is, yes, don't look too much into one specific school because there is this random factor in it. And you're just gonna, I guess, kind of have to cross your fingers, right? And hope that whatever's going on in that admissions office ends up going your way. And if it doesn't, there's many other schools out there. So that's gonna wrap it up for today's video. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I will leave the link to this article down in the description down below. Uh, definitely, once again, encourage you guys to read this article. Um, and if you guys enjoyed this video, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Get us to 100 subscribers. We are super close to that milestone. So please go ahead and subscribe. All right, until next time, I will see you all later. Peace.